Hi there, my name is Caitlin Bandy and this is my channel Bandy's Books and today we are here to talk about a couple different books. At the beginning of the month, my friend Allie from Allie Loves to Read over on Instagram picked out three books for me to read and she made some great selections. So I have read them over the course of the last two weeks and I am here today to review her picks and tell you how she did, what I thought of each one. So we're gonna go down these books one by one in the order that I read them, and then at the end, I'll tell you which one was my favorite. So our first book was Hana Khan Carries On by Usma Jalaluddin, and this is a book about a character named Hanan Khan, who everybody calls Hana. And Hana is really excited about radio and radio broadcast. She is working in a radio station, and it's kind of her first job, and she's you know trying to get her foot in the door. She has a boss that doesn't really quite understand her, but is overall like a fairly nice person. She is working on a podcast anonymously as well, and she's also helping part-time at her mom's halal restaurant, which is called Biryani Poutine. She comes from a Canadian Indian background and her family is Muslim. Their halal restaurant initially is the only halal restaurant in this neighborhood, and then a competing restaurant opens up across the street and kind of a rivalry forms between Hana and the guy that opens up this restaurant. And um, there initially is this kind of feeling that there can only be one halal restaurant in the neighborhood. So I really enjoyed this book. I loved Hana as a character, first of all. I love that this book focused in on a Canadian Indian with Muslim religious beliefs. And I felt that she was like a really positive representation too. Like I didn't feel like it leaned heavy into stereotypes. This wasn't like the super strict family that didn't allow her any you know, freedom or any choice in life. Her family is pretty progressive and very supportive of their children and their children's desires, encouraging their dreams. They're really good parents. And I just loved that positive representation because I feel like oftentimes when we have books that focus on Muslim characters, they tend to lean into cultural stereotypes. So I, I love that that wasn't necessarily the case here. One thing that I really loved, which maybe wouldn't stand out to most people, but does stand out to me, is the portrayal of the restaurant life. So Hannah's mom owns this restaurant and it's hard work. You know, she's doing these long hours, she's on her feet, her kids are there helping out. Um, when the restaurant's slow, you know, they can't afford staff, so the family is all pitching in to try to make things work. I just thought that they really covered what it is like to own a restaurant. I thought that that whole bit was really well done. Another thing that I really enjoyed was the portrayal of online friendships. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Hana has a podcast and she's doing it anonymously. And she has this supporter that she's found through the internet. And he is going by the name of Stanley and he's always encouraging her and supporting her. And he's kind of like her cheerleader. And I loved that positive portrayal of this online friendship. I have found that in real life, I've had several internet friends who have been as dear to me as friends that I know in person. And it's just, you know, I feel like sometimes society like makes fun of internet relationships or internet friendships, like they aren't real or they don't count. So I loved that that was a theme in the book that this person that's so important to her is initially just an internet friend. One of the biggest things that I loved about this book was the messaging around being woke, diversity, and racism. So throughout the story, we see Hannah's boss at the radio station who is a probably middle-aged white woman and she's kind of tone deaf. Like initially, I feel like she's trying her best to, you know, make diverse hires and, you know, promote diverse content on her channel, but she's just kind of superficial with it. Like she's not really doing the research she needs to do to understand. She's just kind of superficially like, oh yeah, let's add a little bit of diversity here. Let's add a little bit of diversity there without really understanding. For example, she wants to have a segment on the radio where Hannah talks about like what it's like to be a Muslim girl. And so Hannah comes with stories about her own family and her own family's experience. And this woman tells her, oh no, that's not authentic. You know, people won't buy that. That's too progressive for an Indian woman. You know, we want something that's more like you know, why terrorists are wrong or like defend your religion kind of content. And Hana really pushes back against that. She's like, I don't want to just be known as the Muslim girl. I want to be known for like my family and who I am and my desires and my dreams and all these other things that are going on in my life, not just for my religion. Um, and she's kind of put in that position a lot where she's either going to have to defend something that she doesn't want to have to defend or talk about something she's uncomfortable talking about. So I appreciated that discussion of how it's not good enough to just 
artificially slap diversity into things we need to like thoughtfully include people and thoughtfully encourage diversity her attempts eventually just come across as really disingenuous and i love that hana kind of lets us explore that with her lets us understand through her eyes why those attempts are disingenuous why they're uncomfortable um i thought that was really good framing for that racism is also a really big theme within this book and i feel like there's two types of racism that occur within this book we have subtle racism which is like more microaggressions or people just making insensitive comments maybe they're not intending to be racist but it's like oftentimes well-intentioned people that are saying things that are racist that they don't really realize are racist so i call those people subtle racists and then we have your in your face racists that are like out protesting in front of her mom's restaurant picketing um graffitiing doing things that are very overtly racist and so there's this positioning within the story where Hannah is having to confront racism and it's interesting the book kind of shows you that it can oftentimes be more difficult to confront subtle racism than it can be to confront overt racism because somebody that's overtly racist is detestable and you know it's easy to not like them and to be like oh this person isn't even worth the time or the effort or you just you know write them off but somebody that's subtly racist, I think she gets put in a position where she's like wanting to believe that this person is well-intentioned or believe the best of this person, but they keep making these little subtle, uncomfortable comments or subtle microaggressions. And I think that people get gaslit. They even maybe gaslight themselves sometimes and go, oh no, that's not racism. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. And so we see Hana go through that process of like her boss and people that are working with her making uncomfortable comments or putting her in comfortable positions. And she tries to go, oh no, she's really nice. She's really nice and make excuses until she eventually comes to the conclusion that no, she's just kind of ignorant. So I thought that that was a really thoughtful portrayal of racism because it isn't always overt racism that people are dealing with. I think on the day to day, most people are dealing more with subtle racism than just this like slap you in the face racism. And so I thought that that particular issue was really well detailed. My only real issue with this book was that I did feel like some of it was a little bit rushed. Um, it is fast paced, a lot happens, there's several different plot lines and they all weave together to create a pretty good story. However, I felt because there was so much going on in so many different departments, um, I felt that oftentimes the emotional impact of the things happening was skipped. So, I mean, we see some of Hannah's emotions and things like that, but I feel like she moves through the emotions really rapidly and that's just because there's so many things happening. I do understand that with the amount of subjects to cover and the different plot threads to wrap up that the story does have to move at a fast pace. That was just my only thing is I felt like I wanted maybe a little more emotional depth from a couple of the situations that occurred. There is a romance plot line in the story and I'm personally not the biggest romance reader but I did think that that romance was done pretty well and I liked that there was growing. It wasn't like an insta love where they meet and fall in love and everything's rainbows and butterflies. There are some real life issues that they have to overcome in order to get to a point of being like, can we make it as a couple? Um, so kudos for that, for a more realistic romance. All in all, I enjoyed this read and I would definitely consider reading Jalaluddin again. I think that her writing was pretty well done and I've heard good things about Aisha at last. I think that's her other book. Um, so I'll consider reading that in the future. Next up is Big Chicas Don't Cry by Annette Chavez Macias. And this is a book that follows four cousins and it weaves each of the cousins' stories together in and out. So we have four different POVs. We literally get to see the story from each one's perspective at different points. I really enjoyed this. I think that each of the sisters is relatable in a different way. Each sister has a unique personality and a unique issue. All, all four of them are dealing with romance and love to a certain degree, but in different ways. So we have Gracie who is a bit more conservative. She works at a Catholic school. She's still a virgin at the beginning of the story. And she's very fearful of dating. She's not had good experiences when she's tried to pursue romance in the past. And so she's like one really unique character. We have Mari who is kind of isolated from the family. Her mom and father got divorced when she was a little kid and she blames her father for a lot of the problems within the household. And so it's kind of caused her to be a bit estranged from the rest of her family. And the other three cousins like reflect on Mari and how sad that it is that she's not there at these family gatherings and things. Mari is married and her husband is very wealthy. He's a lawyer. He basically wants her to be a stay-at-home trophy wife and she's kind of struggling with feeling unfulfilled. 
and occasionally she thinks of her cousins and what her cousins would think of her situation, what her abuelita would think of her situation. And um, there's a lot of reflection on her end as well of like missing this closeness with her family. And then we have Erica who is newly single and she's dealing with the boss from hell. He just seems to not be able to stand her for whatever reason and the two are like oil and vinegar. They just do not get along. And finally, we have a character named Selena who is kind of feeling stuck between cultures. She's not quite Mexican enough for her Mexican family and she's not quite white enough for her white work environment. And furthermore, she's frustrated in her work environment. She feels resentful because her boss keeps putting her in this position of like, hey, we're trying to branch out and market to Latino readers. Like, what do you think as a Mexican woman, how should we approach this? And she's like, I don't know. I have no idea how to deal with this. Um, but they, they just kind of unofficially make her the expert of diversity. First of all, my favorite thing about this book was the relationship between the four women and their family members. So we see that this is a super close knit family. Even Mari, who is the one that's estranged from the family, is still close to some of the family members. She clearly really loves her abuelita and talks with her regularly. I thought the representation of like the family getting together, the cookouts, like the different events, all that was really well done. I also love that each of the four POV characters has a really different perspective and is a very different human being. Each of them is very distinctive. It was super easy to tell who was talking at what time because each character was really unique. I didn't struggle feeling like, oh, they're all so similar and you know, they're best friends. So they're basically copies of each other. It, no, it felt like they were each individuals. And um, I really appreciated that individually you could reach each story on its own. I also really, really appreciated that everything in this book was not happily ever after. When I started reading this, especially when I realized that there was quite a bit of romance in this particular book, I was really worried that everything was going to turn into a big happy ever after. And my biggest problem with that is that's not realistic to life. Life is not all happily ever after. There's lots of great moments, but there's definitely sad ones too. And so I thought that this book was excellent at balancing the happy and the sad. And I also felt like the emotional fallout from some of the events that occur was very well done. This wasn't like, oh, I'm sad for a minute and everything's better all of a sudden. There was actual time that takes place where people, you know, have to heal and recover and things get ugly and messy. I, I thought that the emotions around things were really beautifully done. I also can understand how this would be a super relatable book. I think that the four different characters, I think pretty much anyone reading this book would be able to identify with one of the four characters. They're all so representative of different women that I've grown up around or different people in general that I've grown up around. And I can literally think of friends that were similar to the different people in the book. I can definitely see how my friend Allie really related to this book. I know that she related to three of the four characters and um, I can definitely see the things that might have, you know, been endearing to her that might have felt a bit like her own experience. That said, I did have kind of a similar critique that I had with the first book in that I felt like maybe at times this felt just a little bit rushed. It wasn't anything really major. It's just there's four people, there's four relationships, there's all the work stuff going on, all the family drama, all that. And it's packed into a relatively short book. Um, so it's just stuff is constantly happening. And sometimes I wish there was just a little bit more time to sit and kind of sink into the deep emotions, especially at one particular point, there is a tragic event that occurs that's very impactful to the family. And while there is time spent on it and like people don't necessarily instantly recover, I do think that it could have taken up a little bit more space in the book. Um, but all in all, again, a really solid read, something I really enjoy, something I think most people would find relatable. Um, the romance in this was enjoyable as well. I didn't notice that any of it was insta-love. There are a few romantic tropes, but I thought they were tastefully done. Um, so I wasn't like off put by the romance arcs in the story at all. And book number three is Legend Born by Tracy Dion. This is a book that I've been wanting to read for quite a while. I am a big fantasy fan. I've actually checked it out on Libby twice, but both times that I had it, I actually ran out of time and then I couldn't renew it because there was a wait list. So I've meant to read it several times over, so I'm really happy that I finally got the chance. This story follows Brie Matthews, who has recently just lost her mom in a tragic accident. She is 16 years old and she is at a residential school that is designed for advanced high schoolers and it kind of mimics like a college experience. 
she is a really good student but in her rebellious state she's out late one night and she happens to witness a magical event that she can't explain it has demons it has a sorcerer and a whole bunch of stuff that's really confusing and at the end of the event this sorcerer of sorts tries to wipe her memory except she can still remember everything it doesn't set and that leads her down this whole road of discovery of magic knights of the round table demons entering the world the sword of excalibur and um, she gets a lot more than she bargained for she also finds out that maybe her mom's death wasn't quite so accidental and she ends up kind of in this dilemma of what will she do to discover the truth i really enjoyed this one it's fast paced it's heavy in the adventure and the action and the fantasy all of the things that you want in a fantasy book are here so we have the original legend of arthur and the knights of the round table and you know the sort of excalibur and all that and this definitely ties into that but we have it in a modernized way it somehow fits within the real world the short of it is that the descendants of arthur and the knights of the round table are sworn to protect the earth forever from these demon-like spawn so Bree gets immersed into this world of magic, but she's still going home to the real world. So 50% of the time she's in a world that we know and we understand and there's issues that are normal to like a 16 year old. She's still got classes. She's still got a dad calling and checking up on her. She's still got boy problems. She's still got teachers that want to know when she's going to get her assignments done. She's got therapy and things that all fit within like our reality here. And then 50% of the time she's in this magical world that has demons and knights and honor and a whole system. And um, it's really interesting how the two kind of mesh together. I thought this did an excellent job of merging fantasy and reality. One of the things that I really loved about this book was the inclusivity in the book. As I mentioned, our main character, Brie, is Black. Her best friend is Asian. There are several LGBTQ characters throughout the book. And all of these characters are incorporated seamlessly. And our MC Brie in particular is really wonderful. She's so smart and clever. I love the way that she fights for things and stands up to people. She's not at all a passive character. She doesn't isolate herself with her own power. She actually learns to rely on other people and some of her strengths are in her ability to reach out and create a team. I really love that. I, I feel like there's this thing in fantasy often where a woman in order for her to be a tough character she has to be just completely emotionally isolated and blocking everybody out and angry and there is some anger there for Brie because her mom has just died and she's grieving but it's not this like pent-up rage that I've been seeing a lot in in female characters in fantasy I thought Brie was much more realistic and um, I really appreciated the way in particular that they dealt with grief I also really loved that therapy is normalized in this book at one point, Brie is struggling a little bit and her father sets up therapy with a family friend. And Brie has several therapy sessions throughout this book where she's talking to her therapist about her mother, memories of her mother, questions about the things that are going on in her life. And I thought that was a really beautiful thing. I often see mentions of therapy in books, but it's rare that I see multiple times where someone is sitting down and talking to their therapist. So I really appreciated that that was included within this book because this is targeted at a YA audience. I think it's even more important to make that note that therapy is important, that it can help you heal, that there's nothing to feel ashamed of by going to a therapist. This book is definitively a fantasy, but one of the things that I thought was really, really well done is the way that things like racism and grief were incorporated into this story. So. That's what I kind of was getting at earlier when I was saying there was a lot of real life elements included in this fantasy. And I thought that this was a good example. So Brie, when she meets all the Knights of the Round Table, the majority of them are white. And there is some hostility towards her. She's kind of treated as if she's not part of them, even though she has all of these magical powers that qualify her to be there. And she kind of has this experience where she's made to feel like she's other. And I thought that that was really flawlessly done. It was not like the overwhelming thing. It wasn't like beat you in the head with it, but it was there enough that you're like, oh, hey, these, these, these issues of racism and grief and things permeate her life. And um, it wasn't like, oh, this fantasy world, everything's perfect and all those real life issues go away. So I thought that, that was really well done. My only real critique within this book is the romance plot. There are two things that occur in this book that are typical romance tropes, both of which I personally do not like. And this is a personal taste thing. This is not necessarily a critique of the book, just from my perspective. 
I'm sure other readers might enjoy this, but there is kind of an instant love situation when Brie meets Nick. They kind of have this just instant spark, an instant connection. It's not just, oh, I'm interested in you or, oh, I think I might be attracted to you. It's like, I would die for you. We have a soul bond. And for me, it's frustrating when like there's a fantasy reason for two people to be so soul bonded to each other, especially at a young age. And I know it's explained in the book and it makes sense within the story and everything, but it's just not my cup of tea. I prefer to see people get to know each other and like fall in love with each other in a more realistic way, especially when we're talking about like 16 year olds in this book. I feel like 16 is just too young to be soul bonded and magically in love with somebody. And then the second thing is that we're teased with a love triangle. And I think of all the tropes in the world, I hate love triangles the most. Um, I, on one hand, I'm like, I'm supposed to believe that this girl is magically in love and possibly in a soul bond with this guy, Nick, but then she's flirting with this other guy on the side and there's this will they, won't they tension. And he's of course got a chiseled jawline and green eyes and he's smoking hot um, and he's mysterious and dark and edgy. So, you know, then we've got the good guy and the, is he maybe actually a bad guy? No, he's not really a bad guy, but he's got the heart of gold kind of situation. And Brie, while we see her pretty much siding with the good guy, there's enough interest with the bad guy that we kind of wonder if she's going to end up going in his direction. I didn't love that part of it. I honestly would have really much more loved it had she just made friends with the bad guy and got to know him and been like, oh no, he's not really a bad guy at all. Um, I was wrong in my judgment of him, but it, that hint of it being a love triangle just kind of, it's not my thing. Overall though, I loved this book. I think this was a really cool fantasy. I love how it spun Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. I love the diversity, the inclusivity. I think that even adults will read this if you're a fan of fantasy and really enjoy it. I do think that maybe having at least a basic understanding of what the Knights of the Round Table is and like the Legend of Excalibur, but you don't need it like in any sort of detail. As long as you kind of have just a general outline of what the story is, then you will go into this and probably love it. So overall, I think that Allie picked out some really good books. I didn't really have any doubts about that. I knew that she was going to pick some stuff that might challenge me or push me a little bit, but overall that I was likely going to like. Uh, I was happy with all four reads. My favorite of the three was probably Legendborn, just because I think I've been craving a really good fantasy. I've been reading a lot of literary fiction and contemporary fiction lately, and a lot of those are like explorations of individual characters or families. So I feel like for me, Legendborn just felt like a bit of a breath of fresh air, whereas Hanakan and Big Chicas both felt like a continuation of things that I was already reading. Um, but all in all, I liked all three books, would recommend all three books, especially if you like romance combined with like modern issues. And I'm super happy that Allie was willing to participate in this project with me. I feel so honored that she was willing to be my first friend to pick my books and um, what a great job she did. So if you haven't already followed Allie, go over to Instagram, follow her at Allie Loves to Read. She has a great account and she posts lots of diverse reading and she's so much fun. Get to know her. She's such a sweetheart and such a genuine person too. So that being said, that's the end of the first month of letting a friend pick books for me. I have someone else lined up for next month and I'm not going to say any more than that. Just know that I'm super excited about it. I can't wait to see what they end up picking out. And uh, if you like this video, hit that thumbs up, comment down below and let me know, do you ever let anyone else pick out your books? Friends, family, um, you know, do you use a randomizer? You put a bunch of books on the floor and let your dog pick them out. Like, how do you pick out books if you don't pick them out yourself? 